Welcome to Toxicology, brought to you by Recovery Unplugged, the place where we talk about all things substance abuse, recovery, and mental health, with guests offering varying perspectives and viewpoints. Hosts Joseph Gorordo and Jason Cabello share about their addiction and recovery and other serious subject matter through lighthearted yet candid conversation. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks. Melissa Fair. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forego the whole uh, intro thing since we've been sitting here for a while and All talking, right. I think. Cool. Uh, we, probably, we probably spent some of the stuff that we should have been talking yeah. about on here, but that's, you know, you get two people in a room who have a lot of things in common and, and it just sort of, sort of starts happening. Yeah. So you are, we are in Austin, Texas now. Yes. And you are here for South by Southwest. Yes. What do you, obviously, you know, you could talk... It's not going to go out tonight, so you can't promote what you're going to be doing. But what are you doing here in Austin for for South by? Sure, yeah. Um, first of all, it's awesome to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, it's just this is a really nice part of my trip down here to Austin. I came down here for South by Southwest. I'm on a panel called "License to Ill: The Cost of Not Prioritizing Wellness" oh. um, with a new uh, a new friend called um, Marnie Wadner, who is a therapist. Uh, uh, she works a lot with Chinese medicine. She has a lot to do with um, uh, archetypes and um, helps people in the industry, targeted into the music industry and artists deal with stress and burnout. Those are her, those are her focuses. So um, I did a panel with her uh, or I did a pa- one of her panels at Folk Alliance International, which was in Kansas City this year. And then I just did uh, South by Southwest with her. Really like Marnie's work a lot. And then I'm playing a showcase here. Uh, and I manage two artists now that are both on Kill Rock Stars records. Uh, and one of them, Brennan Waitle, uh, her single comes out on Thurs- on the Thursday of South by Week called Fake Cowboy. So she she was on um, morning TV and she's playing like three shows in Austin. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing down here. And who's, who's the other artist that you're working with? The other artist is named Joe Chase. And Joe's based out in Los Angeles. They have a track out right now called Gone. And we're getting ready to drop um, the next one uh, when, called When I Got This Place. And then my favorite song on their album comes out uh, after that, which is called um, to, For- uh, to Forget You, which I just I just love. I love all my artists, all their songs. And they're both on Kill Rock Stars? They're both on Kill Rock Stars. That's yeah, isn't right. that kind of crazy? Label yeah. mates with Elliot Smith. Yeah, and I'm on Kill Rock Stars too, which is so weird. So That's it's amazing. just like, uh, yeah, it seem- yeah, it seems... Seems like it's a. It is a little family. It really does feel like. That. I mean, I I followed all the all the indie labels from you know the '90s and stuff. But Kill Rock Stars yeah. was definitely one of my favorites. All the early Riot Girl stuff. Yeah, and, the Bikini um, Kill. Yeah, yeah. Bratmobile and Bratmobile. All, I yeah, love that stuff. Stuff yeah. is so close to my heart, and it brings me back to the to the '90s. And yeah, is that kind of the scene that you came up in a little bit? It is, but you know what's weird is that that's not really like that was the music I wanted to play in my heart, like and in my soul was that my music sounded like that in my head as far as like being like a punk. I felt like I was a, I feel like I am a bit of a a punk in my, in how I am in the world. And what I mean by that is that I, I live a very honest and um, direct life. And I think that that's very punk rock. I think, you know, uh, in lyric, strong lyrics, which I don't know that everybody kind of really gets that about punk music, that it, Punk, punk rock, punk music, not just punk rock, um, is very lyrically driven, and right. it's it's very uh, rebellious because it's truthful. Yeah, <laughs> and the truth is, uh, in many ways, re- uh, rebellious because it's it's raw, you know. Yeah, and that, that's what I love about like punk rock. You know, you and yeah. I know what we mean when we talk about punk rock. It's yeah, the whole lifestyle. And I loved in like the late 80s when the New York hardcore guys started straying away from wanting to look like, you know, the Mohawks and Mm -hmm. the studs and leather jackets. And they started kind of looking a little bit more like preps, you know, (laughs) and that that was punk rock at that time because it's like you think this is how I'm supposed to look because this is the kind of music I like. Well, you know, I'll show you. And they kind of straightened up the way they look. And then Ian MacKay with with the whole straight edge movement was like, you know, everybody thinks that we're supposed to be burnouts and, you know, sitting in the gutter and like, no, we're like, 
Totally. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you don't get to define who we are. Yeah. You know, and that that's like the feeling that when I think of punk rock, that's what I feel. It's like, yeah. you don't get to tell me who I am. You don't get to tell me what I should look like or sound like. For and, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, those early 90s were like, well, I made my first record in 93. Well, drinking was working then, you know, for mm -hmm. me. Drinking worked for me until I was t about 26. And then um, that's when I got sober. But uh, I, I, um... I really just wanted to be famous, you know? I just really wanted to be famous. I, I, and, and, and even, let me back that up. I think I, I really just wanted to be liked. Okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, yeah. As the true uh, alcoholic that I am, you know, I, I, I had a inferiority complex with a, you know, whatever, like, whatever that's called. I want you to like me, but I don't want to give a shit about you. Well, yeah, it wasn't that, no, actually. Okay. No, it was more like, I, I want you to like me because I don't like myself. You know, oh, I have yeah, a, I have yeah. a hole and I have like a, like a hole that isn't being filled by anything, you know? So, so I made records and I didn't know how to make records and, and I, and I, and I just learned, I just absorbing things as it went, but like, um, you know, this album Exile from Guyville came out by Liz Fair that yeah, time, yeah. and it just absolutely blew my mind. And it's still it's still one of my favorite records. Um, and I just remember when that record we were on the same record label. I you know I was at a cookout with her once, and I just saw that it, I don't know that this was true for her, but to me, she was a woman who was able to able to put on tape what she was hearing in her head. Right. You know, and um. And I really wanted that, and I and I didn't have that capacity yet. So I was really um, inspired by that. And you know, it was ninety three, ninety four. So and Exile came out, and you know, we had Soundgarden, we had Nirvana, and yeah. I just I was not making records that sounded like that. It just was, and it was, and then the drinking really picked up, and um, my insecurities, along with um, a lack of success musically, it just just drove me further down and down and into you know a pretty where I got pretty dark right um before i before i you know started my life over really and you got sober you said at 26 i was 26 it was 1996 i was living in la um yeah when i first got sober i got sober in 96 and i stayed i mean this is just the fast version of my story right. but i mean I, I i stayed in recovery which has meant different things to me through at, at different points in my life. I, but I stayed uh, going to meetings and working steps and um, being around sober people. Sponsoring you know. people. Yes. I, I sponsored one girl. I, that was it. So I only did that from 96 to 99. Mm -hmm. And then I got in a car and went to work. And I and I began my years of sobriety, as I like to call it now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was more, in some ways, those years were, as it got bad, those years were really painful, really, really painful. And uh, yeah. I picked up in 2008 and uh, I was out for two years and I got, and I've been sober and in, uh, you know, I call it like 360 recovery um, since 2011. Okay. So, yeah. So that was, so those two years when you yeah. were, when you were back out there, what, yeah. what was, cause I mean, you, you hear it all the time in meetings, like, mm. It's hard to have like a, a gut full of alcohol with a head full of recovery. Oh, yeah, it was the worst thing ever. Whatever it is, right? Because well, oh, yeah. especially when you start feeling that certain way, like I want out. And then for me, so I never, I, I, it took me seven years of, well, it didn't take me seven years to get clean, but it took me seven years of going to rehab, mm -hmm. wanting to get clean, but then keep on I would keep on getting in my own way you know what I mean because and I heard somebody else say this um I think it Jake the Snake Roberts the wrestler I heard him say it and I was like this is exactly how I feel so he would go into treatment and he'd be the guy who would sit closest to the therapist raise his hand do all of his work and just want to get it mm -hmm. and then that disease once that door hits would be like this is a great job let's go get one more drink Mm. Or one more drug, whatever it is, and then we'll get this recovery started. And that that's what happened to me for seven years. So yeah. it was seven years of bouncing around. So I could never put more than I'd say thirty days together in, in the seven years that I tried until until I ultimately um when I went to recovery unplugged in two thousand sixteen. It was just something different. And it was, you know, it was every you know, everything just came together. I was I I had no more hustle left in me. I didn't want to, because I mean, I, I was a junkie, junkie. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, in public bathrooms and just like on the streets. And 
it got to the point where it just didn't the drugs didn't work anymore like it just didn't fill that hole anymore and like I felt like I was betrayed by my God because it was the only thing that I had given anything to and I gave everything to it, you know, and that starts working and the emptiness, which we all have in common, which is the great thing about, you know, um, people who have been through it, no matter what their substance was, no matter where they were in life, that one feeling of wanting to stop, you can't stop, it's not working anymore, how do I do it? And then... For me, I know I asked for help for years before I actually accepted it. And once I accepted the help, then it was like, oh, well, things do get a little bit yeah. better. Things do get a little bit brighter. Yeah. You know, so what was, what was the, what brought you back after the two years? Um, I think, uh, there was a, the bottom that I had in L.A. in 96 was a physical bottom, you know. And the bottom that I hit in 2011 was uh, a soul-crushing <laughs> uh, mental bottom. I wasn't drinking that much. Um, the The two years I was out, I was, you know, I drank, Um Alcohol. I'm a. I'm a. I'm what the book calls a real alcoholic. Mm. Uh, you know, drugs aren't a part of my story yet. Um, but I. Um, I was drinking. You know. Uh, sometimes I get drunk. Sometimes I wouldn't get drunk. Sometimes I would. But I was thinking about drinking all the time. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how I didn't drink. I was thinking about how there was. I. I did leave one beer in the six pack, and it's in the fridge while I'm laying in bed, thinking about the one beer in the six pack, and the, you know. The mental obsession drove me fucking. Sorry, can I don't know if I please do. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. It drove me fucking crazy. And um, but you know there was a there was a situation that happened. There was a relationship that um, you know, shit just got real bad, real bad, real scary, really um, untruthful. I was I was uh, lied to and betrayed in a in a in a way that. I just I just had never had that happen to me before, and um, you know it was I had a moment w w when I realized what was going on. It was as if the world tilted. I mean, it was that kind of like what it like morally the world just went, you know. And right. I've always been a really I mean, you could ask any of my friends. Like I I barely cross the street not on a crosswalk. So I like I have okay. a moral compass too. Like I just can't handle like pe when people are like mean or it just I mean I can't even talk about it as you can see it just I don't understand it you know yeah yeah so that happened and um I surrendered you know I was surrendered I hit my knees and the first thought I had was I got to go back to AA mm -hmm. because that was the only thing that had ever worked for me you know like that was when I was happiest was when I was you know, it was West Hollywood. It was gay. All the gay boys saved my life. It right. was fun. We would go out to lunch after. I mean, like, yeah, there's like all that about it. But I had a, I had a grasp of my center when I was in actual recovery and, and I was happy, um, you know, but I, I would, in, in those years of sobriety, when I was touring and doing like 250 shows a year between 1999 and 2006, I didn't stop. And um, I ended up in 2006, I ended up uh, having to go into the hospital for um, adrenal failure. You know, like I had complete exhaustion. I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I couldn't, I couldn't tour anymore. And um, I wasn't, I was you know, I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or anything like that. And, um, you know, just, just depressed and, and, uh, un needing help. And I think that the, you know, I, the isolation of a musician, I think the only other job I've seen out there that's probably more isolating than the singer songwriter in a car is a comedian. Right. Yeah. You know, who's playing like Kowloon's on route mm -hmm. one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I'm the, from the Boston. Road, the road comedians. Yeah. Fucking Kowloon's is like, that is like, that is like the worst. Like, uh, like I've played some pretty shitty shows in in like a bar where people have been drinking since ten a.m. and people don't care, you know. And I'm like singing songs about how love hurts, you know. And they're like, nobody cares. <laughs> but like, anyway, it's a lonely place out there, right. and you're in bars every day. And 
There's, you know, you show up and you say you don't drink and they still have a bucket of beer in the back. It's, it's a, it's a weird life. Yeah. You know this life. Yeah. It's, it's weird. And then sometimes people will think like when you say you, you don't, you know, I don't drink alcohol. They think like you're joking. Right. They're like, <laughs> get the fuck out like, of here. Oh, what did you have a late night last night? I'm like, yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a late night in 1995. You want to hear about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. All, all the, uh, all the 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 little things that we say when we try to not like somebody like hey you need a drink like oh you don't have enough for you know whatever <laughs> to just try to get the point you like you don't want to have to tell your whole story to somebody but it's just like no I lost those privileges that's what that's what I I mean I that. told some lady once like the look on her face when I said one of those classic things I was like do you want me to try to sleep with your husband and set the place on fire <laughs> <laughs> That's, a good one. That's what I said, yeah. and but she didn't think it was funny. You know right. what I mean? Because she's not one of us. I'm right. like, and what's not funny is that. I, I would probably, that's what right, I do. Yeah, you know, yeah. like when I drink, I turn into a straight woman. You know what I mean? I, I start taking my shirt off and making out with guys, which is like, you know, I'm, that's not who I am. Right. So it's just, um, it's hilarious and also really sad at the same time. So yeah, yeah it's a, I, I find that I lost those privileges is a good one where it's just like, okay, I yeah. get, you know, I get it. But yeah, yeah, I used to say some shit that would like piss some people oh, off. And it's like, God. why am I attacking this person? They don't, they don't know. They're just, you know, and they don't Crazy. know, you know, and I get it. Cause I was, I was the other side. Like I didn't really, I, I had a friend who was a bartender at one of the places like in Miami that I would DJ at and, and book shows yeah. at and stuff. And I heard that they weren't, weren't drinking or doing drugs. And then NA, like they were like, oh no, they're in the program. They're in NA. And I was like, oh, is that like court mandated or something? Like, I, <laughs> like, you know, I, didn't, go. I didn't think anybody would make the choice to not do this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this great stuff. Yeah, that's you know? hilarious. But yeah, and then like come to understand later, it's just like, oh no, like normal yeah. people who, and that's what I love about the program. And, and another misconception is like, I don't have anything against drugs or alcohol. Yeah. I fucking loved alcohol yeah. and drugs, you know? And my those are my people. Yeah. Like, you know, the fuck ups and the and the weirdos and all that. And it's just like, no, I just I just Yeah, and it's a bummer too. Like I don't I, I definitely don't get invited to stuff sometimes. And uh, and it bums me out because I'm like I, I like I actually can't stand it when someone doesn't order a drink in front of me. It's like what the drink isn't going to jump across the table and like right. you know you know so I actually kind of find that the people that do drink around me are the ones that don't have a problem with alcohol when I'm right. like oh yeah it doesn't bother me if you drink and they're like okay cool you right know? exactly but those folks that are like not and then generally speaking I feel like they're just like hanging out thinking about how they can't drink because I'm there right <laughs> and I'm like you want to come to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like it when my girlfriend drinks because then I become much more handsome and charming. You know, <laughs> that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Oh god. So growing up in Boston, yeah, going to to punk shows a lot mm. or more uh, singer songwriter stuff. Or? No, I would say what kind of shows? That's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, let's see. Well, I didn't really start to go to shows until I went to college. I went to Berkeley College of Music. Okay. Uh, for two years, I lasted there before I moved to New York. Uh, I was going to the Middle East and teaching the Bears. That's where I hung out. Those and those are rock clubs in right. Boston. So, I was seeing my friends' bands play mostly. Just some of my friends at Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, then when I moved to New York, I lived in the East Village. I lived on third, fourteenth uh, between second and third. So, and I was playing CBGBs and um, Sine. Uh, those were in the bitter end. Those were my three haunts. So I was pretty much just going to shows there. And what what era was this? What, what? I lived in yeah. I was so I was playing CBs at that was uh, nineteen ninety. Okay. Ninety to ninety one. Because in ninety one I went on the Morrissey tour, and that's. That's what I got discovered, you know, on on that tour and signed with Atlantic in 1992. So, yeah, I, I guess I was driving down in New York in 89 and doing shows. But then I moved there in 1990. I only lived there for one year. But, uh, yeah, that that's what I was doing. I don't, what's interesting is that when I was young, I didn't really go to a lot of shows. As a musician, like a working musician, it's hard to go to see other people play because yeah. you're playing all the time. That's why I love festival season. 
Do you love festivals? Oh, I love it because I get you to get see bands play. You get all in at once and then leave. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then you like see each other and you're like, oh my God, I love your band. Or like, oh, I played at that. I always see your posters because you're two days ahead of me on tour. Like that's, you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I could imagine. See, I, I never. So growing up in Miami, whenever a festival would come to town, it would always be in summer and it would always be. Too hot. Way too hot. And it's like, I have to. The three bands I like, like, is the the first band on the second stage, a middle one, and then the very last one. And then I have to sit through all this stuff that I'm just like, oh, man. I really don't want to, to hear all this stuff. Oh, but man. like, because I remember when, when I went to the first Lollapalooza, I went to, you know, a lot of the early ones when the second stage was just amazing. Bands like Liz Fair would be Yeah, playing. yeah, and like, yeah. And for Miami, it was, it was tough just because of the location. You didn't get a lot of smaller bands because yeah. to get from, say, Orlando or Gainesville to Miami in a five-hour drive, like nobody wants to do that and then drive out with nothing in between. So we weren't getting a lot of bands like that coming yeah. in. So when all Lollapalooza would come, you would have bands like Liz Fair or Guided by Voices or something coming in on the second stage that would never come in before. So right. it was like I kind of had to go if I wanted yeah. to catch these bands, yeah. but it was... Um, yeah, that was just a a magical time for for music in my in in my world. Like you know when like all the early Matador record yeah. stuff or sub pop record stuff, Lava that, records. Yeah, well. like any all that stuff. Four AD. I was a yeah. huge four. I am still a four AD fan. Um, yeah. Or what is it? Um, is it Mute Records? Mute Records. Yeah. All the um, Erasure and that whole world it was like a that was like a different world too. Like I loved Pet Shop Boys and like I liked that kind of dance music. Depeche Mode. I was really into them in high school. But then I was a huge Smiths fan and REM early REM. Right. And then um, replacements. Yeah, the replacements. I toured with with that fourteen songs oh. tour with Paul Westerberg in Europe. But then I also loved Till Tuesday and I you know loved Tracy Chapman and you know Suzanne Vega's first record was a brilliant yeah. record with Marlena on the wall and um Edie, Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians. Do you remember that yeah, first course, record, yeah. you know, shooting rubber bands at the stars. That was a great record. Did you get to see Till Tuesday in, in Boston growing yeah. up? Yeah. I saw them once at this place called Don Bosco. I grew up in a little town called Ipswich, Massachusetts, okay. and they played at Don Bosco, which I don't even know what it is, but outdoor thing. And um, and then I saw Amy Mann play at Night Stage. I think it was when she first went solo, went solo as yeah. Amy Mann. Yeah, I don't know. She was actually a really important figure for me as a young uh, young woman. Was she, you know, she went to Berkeley for bass. I played bass. She worked at Strawberries Records. Bef you know, she worked at Strawberries Records and went to Berkeley. So I like. I was playing bass guitar, and I, and so I just did what she did. I got a job at Strawberries Records, and I went to Berkeley because I was like, well, and then she was in a successful band, and I'm like, yeah. okay, what do I do? And I, and I see that now, you know, being somebody who's now been around for a long time, and, you know, now I'm on, like, the board of the, one of the clubs I kind of started at in Boston. It's, like, <laughs> crazy, but helping other artists and seeing them be like, oh yeah, well, you know, I went to that school because you went there or I right. played at this club because I know you said you played here. And it's like, wow, we really do. You know, you, you think you're just doing what you do, but you actually are, you know, people are watching and you do inspire people, you know, so Influence, the, well, yeah. the work, what you guys are doing here is, you know, really inspirational and it does change people's lives, you know, um, just you saying like, this is how you got clean, you know, is this place helps you get clean and like that's really important. Some other some other kid'll hear it. And right. And you hear it when you hear it, you know? Yeah. And and knowing that, you know, you have the people who kind of read between the lines of what you're doing. Like you're paying attention to where she's going to school and, you know, yeah. things like that. And yeah. it's uh I I know anybody I know who's an artist when they hear little things like that, like it, it just absolutely makes their day. Have yeah. have you had an experience like that? Somebody coming to you and yeah, I'm sure you have. I, I mean, have, yeah. What was the what was the what was the most meaningful? I'm trying to. I think. Well, there've been a couple around, really around my songs, you know, and they're very private things. People have told me it's usually about end of life stuff, you know, yeah. that's really heavy, um, and the fact that my voice was present in a in the room mm -hmm. when those things happened, or that a person who was very sick. Uh, would listen to me um, or listen to my song. You know, that that's really, that's just like, you don't think about that kind of, 
I, stuff when you're like, I want to be in a band. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> and you're like, I had um, somebody actually just at the last show I played, which was in Northampton just last week. And this woman showed up with her wife and she goes, um, and this is Aaron. I was like, hi, Aaron. She was like, Aaron is the one that was, she couldn't come to the last show because she was in the hospital. And you, you, you gave her, I, I, I said something to her. I had the, what I did was I had the audience say hello to her and take a minute and just send her love. Like, wow. cause she was live streaming in mm -hmm. and it was just something that we do that, that any, you know, I don't, I think I would hope many people would do that or right. it just seemed like the right thing to do. But what that meant to her was like really huge. And then she, it was a big deal for her to be able to meet me in real life, you know, and yeah. be like, thank you so much for helping me. You're like that really helped. I was lonely in the hospital and like. I could imagine. Yeah. So. That, that must feel great. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. It's those kinds of things. don't. they don't feel like compliments. They just feel like awakenings to maybe the fact that what I'm doing is important. Yeah. So we were, I was having a conversation yesterday. I was on a panel for South by Southwest yeah. talking about, um, you know, the music industry and artists on the road. Yep. And it seems like there, there there's this thing where once you come out as being in recovery, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not talking about the fan coming to you at the merch table and saying like, oh, listen, like I, I know that you're in recovery or asking you a question. But then when some people just want to dig because it's something to talk about and it's like there's some point where you, I think everybody wants to be like, listen, a lot of this stuff is really private for yeah. me. Like I, I don't mind saying like <clears throat> I'm in recovery. I found a way out. But then there's other stuff where it's just like this. This is very personal stuff, and maybe I don't want to, you know, go on a podcast and talk about it. You know? <laughs> like there, there's some stuff that you know I'm sure is like, mm -hmm. you know, you have to keep some sort of anonymity or privacy or 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 what it is. What, what, what do you do? You have any experience with that? Yeah, I think um, yes. I when I in my first. Uh, when I first came in, um, I wanted, I, I talked about, and this was, right, so like 96 to 2000, when I was doing interviews, this was before anybody in, I'm, I'm, you know, in, in going to meetings would, you know, like it was so it taboo. It wasn't like it is now. It was so taboo, you, you just didn't say it because it was against, the, you know, it was against the tradition mm -hmm. and, um you're not allowed to say it. And then there was a movement really, I think it, out of LA that was about um, maybe that's not what Bill meant, you know, and right. like m maybe anonymity at the level of press radio and film. Well, this is radio. Well, maybe it's anonymity just because it was, you know, 1938, whatever, you know, it was right, like, yeah. you know, when people were getting fired, well, people still get fired. Yeah. And, you know, well, if you say that you're sober and then you go out, what's that going to look like? And I'm like, not well, not, well. Not, not to be a representative of I, nobody's a representative right. of it, yeah. right? So, yeah, I think that for me anyway, it's like what I choose to share is what I choose to share, and that changes. You know, mm -hmm. uh, somebody sometimes somebody will ask me something or come to me and s you can tell when, and sometimes I'm ready to be able to help and sometimes I'm not. And I'm just like, I don't feel like talking about it. Yeah. My instinct is this isn't safe for me. So I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I don't, listen, I'm, this is also what's great about being older <laughs> is like my bandwidth for bullshit is so low. And like, I'm really not worried about like whether you think I'm cool or not. You know right. what I mean? Like, I'm just like, I, I'm trying to like get through every day without hurting anybody's feelings or my own or pick up. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to today. But if anything about that rel <laughs> that relapse taught me that I have one day. I, yeah. have, I have one day. There was nothing that anybody thought that I would ever pick up again. And and I did, you know. And so it's like I I <laughs> just like I'm so grateful to – um to have what I've got. I just, I don't, I don't want to lose it. And so I just, I, I'm very cautious. <laughs> I don't, 
yeah, I don't really know how else to say that. It's just like I'm very careful. It's like <laughs> no, I, I have those things set aside. I have three times a week that you cannot, that I do not book for anything else except for my people. And um, Yeah, that's great. And I am very private about that part of my world, you know, and I'm careful. Your personal recovery yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, having this this forum that I talk about stuff on, I... Sometimes, you know, sometimes the conversation flows and sometimes afterwards I'm like, oh, man, I really shouldn't have talked about that. But then, oh. you know, I, I have a good friend because he was on he was on this he was on the show. And sometimes war story type stuff starts happening when yeah. two friends are just talking. The cameras are on. Yeah. And then he was like, do you really think you should have been on like talking about that? And I was like, no. However, like. When I was using, I didn't think anybody who used like me could get clean. Mm, so yeah. maybe if somebody hears like, oh shit, this guy used like like I used and, yep. and he could get clean. So that's the it's like the attraction, not promotion part. Sure. So it's not like I'm saying like read this certain book, go to this certain fellowship, do that. But exactly. it's like listen, I was yeah. a mess for decades yeah. and couldn't get out. Yep. And I did get out for today. Yep. You know, not yeah. I would, and hopefully I'll get to bed tonight yeah. before I have a chance to get in my own way and yeah. you know do it again. And yeah. I think it's important for people to hear that. And I mean, now most twelve step fellowships have like a public relations <laughs> department, which is you know because somebody because I do like commercials and videos and stuff, and somebody was like, "Oh, you should do something for the public relations thing." Yeah, if it's a for profit organization, I mean, like AA doesn't have a public. Re I mean, they don't. No, the, no, the 12 they do now. Yeah, yeah. At Central Service. Yeah, World. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. That's what that's what I was because and somebody was showing me in um, I think in Spain that both AA and A and some other fellowship like they'll have commercials now. Wow. And, it, and I mean, it just leads you to the helpline. It doesn't, you know, do yeah. anything other than that or ask for donations or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's seven traditions and all that. But yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean the, the world's changing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have lots of, you know, I have a, I have other stuff I do besides just that, you know. Right. I mean, I'm on a med for a mood disorder and, you know, I don't talk about that in, uh, that has nothing to do with AA. Right. And um, it's a totally separate thing, you know, and um, there's other other stuff that I do that, you know, like a spiritual practice that I, that I have that's mm -hmm. different. And, um, you know, my diet is different. I don't like, so I think learning that I just needed um, like, kind of like a five-star approach to life, you know, right. life and how to live it. And, um, you know, when you get shot out of a cannon and you're, you're, I, I was, I was in 1990, I was 20 years old when I went on tour with Morrissey, you know, I, and I, and I haven't stopped since then. Right. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of experiences learning how to deal with people or, making friends or getting out of college and like finding a job. Like I didn't, I don't know how to make a CV or a resume. Right. Like I didn't know what that was. I didn't even graduate. I didn't even finish undergrad, you know? Well, I, so, I don't want I don't want to gloss over going on tour with Morris <laughs> because no. that seems like a pretty big fucking deal. Yeah, how, it was how, a huge deal. Can you tell me what, what it was like when you found out that that was going to happen? Sure. Well, I mean, I got the one show was in Boston at what we had called Great Woods back then, um, you know, which is like so weird because that's where I saw NXS when I was like in high school. Um, and then I was playing there. So yeah, I was playing the clubs in Boston. I was playing TT's, TT the Bears mostly. And um, while I was at school and I had a little gaggle, I was doing the open mic first. And then I had a little gaggle of, of mostly young gay girls that were coming to see me play. Um, and maybe like 30, 35 were, were paying to see me play on a Tuesday night. And so the bartender, Jeannie at TT's called a local promoter, um, a woman named Jody Goodman, who worked for Don Law at the time. She was a junior promoter. She's now the head of Live Nation <laughs> on the West Coast. <laughs> and she has been for a long time. She's a very powerful uh, music executive and an amazing human being. Um, she came and saw me play because the bartender was like, you got to come see this girl. 
So she came and watched me. She gave me a few gigs here and there, opening uh, David Broza. I remember I opened for him like at night stage, kind of. Uh, Jeffrey Gaines, I got to open for him when he had his hit song out. Um, so she was giving me chances in the 500 cap rooms for nationals that were coming through. And then um, the opening slot for the Morrissey show happened. His opening act, Frank, who I'm actually now friends with, uh, the uh, <laughs> the Jewish lesbian folk singer Frank, P-H-R-A-N-C, who was out way before many of us were, um, was opening for Morrissey and had to cancel. And she had to fly back home to L.A., so they needed a, a an opener, and it just so happened that I was a lesbian folk singer, you know. <laughs> just kind of fit. The, it just kind of like fit, fit the right bill. In. I mean, I don't think that they they just needed someone solo, but it also just so happened that it was like, look, we have something really similar. She's just not Jewish, and um, so I I replaced Frank and gave Morrissey my cassette. You know, I met him briefly before the show, gave him a cassette, had my phone number on the cassette itself, not just on the jacket, which I teach students. And um, the next day was the 4th of July. The day after that was July 5th, and they had a show in Toronto. And it's the story you've heard a million times, which is the phone rang. And I picked it up, and it was the tour manager. Did you think somebody was pranking you? No. No? You knew? Morrissey listened to your tape. He'd like to know if you'd like to finish the tour. We're sending a car and a limousine showed up in front of my apartment. You know, it wasn't even my apartment. It was like this girl's apartment that I was crashing on the floor of. And I was gone. Whisked away. Whisked away. And then rest of the U.S. And then whisked and went. He took me to Europe. As Took me to the U.K. Inside to the U.K. I came back. And then the record, the record labels were lined up, you know, and I uh, signed a deal. Like I said, those were those days were, you know, it was amazing. It was yeah. an amazing experience. I learned a lot. And, uh, yeah, it was, was freaking great. Did, you, know, did you feel like I've made it or did you feel like imposter syndrome sort of thing? It, it felt like, um, no, I did not feel imposter syndrome um, at all. It was as if I was like, well, of course this is happening. Like, it just felt right. like completely natural. I did not understand that he, I didn't make the connection. I think I was just in shock, to be honest with you. I mean, it was 20. What did I know? Not, right, right. You know, I, I I don't think I realized that he was the guy that, he was the lead singer of The Smiths, of which I was writing the name The Smiths on my jeans in high school. Right, right. And like saving my money to buy the Queen's debt. You know mm. what I mean? Like when by the time we got to the UK, I was I realized that I was like, this is kind of that maybe a big deal, you know? Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I can imagine because it was such a whirlwind from like you just getting the call to the limo showing up, you getting there, mm-hmm. you probably didn't even have time to really wrap your head around it, and especially yeah, going from s- crashing on somebody's floor to living the tour life. I mean, I was in Four Seasons. I mean, he paid me and put me up, and I mean, I was in the Four Seasons hotels with yeah. him. You know, you're getting run after, right? So there's that too, like the Moz Mania. Mm-hmm. And so I was playing, I was opening for a guy who had a fan base, has a fan base that is so passionate and so committed and so um, just there for him and his music. And, you know, by him tapping me, I inherited some of that. And I'm really, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. You know, I mean, Alan White, an amazing guitar player, I was very close with him on the tours. And, I think that maybe part of why I have the fan base I have is because of that tour. I mean, I was able to establish a, 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 a I don't, I don't mean cultish in a gross way. I just mean like a, like, there's got to be a better word for that, but a committed fan base of like, we believe in you no matter what. A rabid, committed yeah. fan base. Supportive, like, yeah. you know? No, like, yeah, like the Moz heads are definitely very... Yeah, um, I don't think... Uh, my ferric heads aren't that that crazy, thank God, but... Uh, <laughs> They're a little bit more down to earth. Well, I'm not nearly as famous as Morrissey is either, but, you know, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool, and thank God I wasn't embarrassing uh, myself drinking. I was young and hot, and it was great. So let's talk about tour life. Okay. Uh, and uh, <laughs> keeping it together during tour life. Yeah. Um, is it? Have you found a balance? Are you still? Are you still touring quite a bit? I mean, I, are you still doing like two hundred shows a year no. touring? Or no, I don't do two hundred shows a year. I, I I would never. I wouldn't do that again. Period. Even if I was in a bus with, you know, millions of dollars, I wouldn't do that. Um, 
Yeah, I probably do about 40 shows a year, which is not that many. But when you consider the fact that I'm a full-time teacher, I'm a professor at Northeastern. Um, Northeastern. Yeah, Northeastern University. Yeah. So Not too shabby. Not too shabby. No, I was at Berkeley for a bunch of years before that. And um, college of music anyway. But uh, yeah, so now I tour. I've been touring more lately because I'm now flying on planes again, which is making many of my fans very, very happy. I mm-hmm. didn't fly on planes for about 10 years. I just started flying again. So um, yeah, I. you mean like with my, like how I deal with taking care of myself while I'm touring? Yeah, just, I mean, let's talk about the days. So the reason I'm bringing it up is because, yeah. you know, and, and I haven't talked haven't talked about this on the podcast yet, though, yeah. the the program that I was telling you that we're starting. Oh, yeah. Um, it's actually called Elsewhere, just because everybody I know who I would talk to, it's <laughs> like the feeling that you get when you're on tour. It's like yeah. you could be playing Cincinnati tonight, but you don't feel like you're, you know, you're not experiencing Cincinnati at all. You're, right. you know, the bus is docking, you're, you're getting ready, you're setting up, you're playing, and mm-hmm. then... Most likely you're you're getting back on the bus and then hitting the next spot. And yeah. You just feel like you're in this this elsewhere yeah. sort of place. So when I was on I was on tour with KISS doing their documentary stuff and you know, they're they're traveling pretty fancy. Yeah. They're, they're on the jet and staying at the four seasons. Yeah. And I have seven years clean at this point. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I couldn't imagine what this would be like for somebody who is mm. new in recovery or looking for recovery. It yeah. is just it 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 you just it's like you're you're in a bubble, right? Mm-hmm. So we're 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 starting a program that is going to help touring musicians, and it's going to be you know it's going to be a, a wide spectrum of services that we're offering, from virtual services to yeah. if we want to provide H and I meetings to them or, or help them out. And I can imagine when you're when you're how old were you when you when you after the Morrissey tour? What was your mm-hmm. tour life like after that? Insane. Yeah. Yeah. And you're sober at this point, or is this before you get into? No, I got sober at 26. My okay. my 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 touring schedule when I w- was 26 on was abs- was absolutely insane. I mean, yeah. it was 200 shows a year for I don't know 26 to. Well, actually, what's weird is that 26 to 2006 when I ended up in the hospital is 96. Is that is that 10 years? No, it's more than 10 years, right? Or, I don't know. What was it? What were the years? 1996 to 2006 is 10. Yeah, years, yeah, 10 right? years. Yeah. So those 10 years before I hit a wall and then um, back working 2011 to now, you know, I mean, it was 12 years of much sane, much more sane yeah. <laughs> existence. Yeah. Were, were you doing anything when you were well, when you were in recovery and on the road to maintain your co- recovery or? Now I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but back before, which which is really something that I worry about for many musicians, and I think which is so interesting that your endeavor is going to try to really be a part of contributing support to is that musician who is on the road and dry. I mean, yeah. with, you're not. I wasn't drinking, but I wasn't participating in any sort of self care at all. I, I mean, the food is terrible. The driving is exhausting. You can't afford a tour manager. Or you can, but they also have to do sound. You can't afford a sound person. The sound person's rude and mean to you. You know, you get ripped off twice. Your gear gets stolen. I mean, your girlfriend breaks up with you. What, whatever. Life is happening and you're, you know, you and you could be anywhere or elsewhere. I, I, you know, I, I mean, you could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you said, like it's, I even felt that way here when I got here. I was like, with the flying on planes thing, I'm like. In four hours, I'm in Austin, Texas. It's like it takes me four hours to drive to New York City. Like right. I, and now, I'm like, what the hell have I been doing? I should I get just get on a plane. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. I'm like, I want to go to Amsterdam. It's like, but anyway, I digress. I think that um, what can happen to me, what happens to me, is that I get in this mindset of like, I'll, it's only a week. I'll be fine. I'll just like, <laughs> it's like, I, I don't. I'm good. I don't need to call my sp- like cat. I don't need to call cat. At, I'll be good. Uh, it's Wednesday. I'm tired. I got to take a shower. I just want to take a shower and try to like order this food so that I don't eat a cheeseburger at one o'clock from room service or whatever. And then it's just one more day without a meeting. And then it's one more day without a meeting. And then it's three months without a meeting. And then it's six months without a meeting. And then I'm a raging lunatic right. that nobody wants to be around. Everything is everybody else's fault. 
And um, I mean, put on top of it, if I'm not taking my med appropriately, Mm -hmm. then I'm not eating right, which means I'm like hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Your sleep's messed up. I am. My sleep's messed up. My panic is up. I can't get on the plane. I'm freaking out. I'm just like, it's not good, you know? And um, and that, for me, I'm more concerned about that. I know I could pick up a drink, but for me, there's, you know... My recovery is also, it's really important for all sorts of reasons. Yes, because if I pick up a drink again, it's, it, I don't know that I'm going to make it back. And um, if, I, if I am not tending to my well-being, um, I might not make it back. <laughs> right. And so it's really a 360 thing. So I think the touring element, because it's so isolating and my diseases, my mental illness um, wants me alone. Mm-hmm. It wants me alone. And, um, and it grows like a plant. It grows like a fungus, you know, and it, it convinces me that I don't need anybody else. Yeah. And as an, as a writer and an artist, um, I really, and I, I really like to be alone. I live alone. I like to be alone. I can drive in a car. I like driving. I, when I drive in a car, there's no music. I don't want to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, 14 hours alone in a car without any noise is like bliss to me. Um, so it's hard. I've been doing a lot of, I, I TA a course called um, The Psychology of Creativity, Eccentrics, Geniuses, and the Harvard Student. Um at Harvard with this woman, Dr. Shelley Carson, who's my mentor, and it's all about the psychology of creativity, right? So all about the research of it, and there's a real, it is a real thing. We are different. (laughs) Our brains are different, man, you know? Definitely. So we have to tend to, so what you guys are talking about is like having these tap-in moments, you know, and even there's been apps here and there that have come out, and I've found those helpful for a period of time. Anything that can um, interrupt my um, interrupting what I the the closing doors of the elevator that want me in there, like the sticking the hand in right to make the doors open up again. Yeah. It's like that's a that's actually a great example. That's a great metaphor that for is. it. Yeah, you guys are talking about being that hand in that elevator that's just going to shut me off, you know, and be like, remember us? Remember us? Yeah, um, because, I mean, the isolation that you feel. Oh, it's huge, man. Feeling alone in a room with thousands of people. Yeah. Is, it is a very, very unique situation that not everybody can understand. Yeah. So I think it has to be done internally by people who understand yeah. what, you know, the touring musician or the, the support goes through. because. Your disease sounds like it's something like mine. It doesn't want me dead, but it wants me to want to be dead Mm. and to just not have... Because I don't need to pick up a substance anymore to hit something, to hit some sort of bottom in myself where it's like, I don't want to get out of bed today. I don't want to do anything. All I want to do is just lay around and not even think about anything, you know, and then... But those days are important too, right? So it's like about really learning how to not... um, Sometimes not allowing those those days for me. I am allowed to have those days. I give those days to myself. It's really important. It's also really important for me to get sad, and to write, and to allow myself to brood and to ruminate. Right. Um, it is part of who I am. Is that you know? when you, is that when you think you write some of your best stuff, or, or when you love to write? Is when you're feeling sort of uh, absolutely melancholy. Yeah. Struggling, any mm-hmm. sort of struggle, any sort of upset, any sort of on edge. Um, when when it when writing comes, I write anyway. You know what I mean? Like I work the muscle. I I write. Uh, That's beautiful that you learn to harness it. Yeah, and like yeah. A valve to to release it out there into the world. What does it feel like when uh, when when a song is is finished or ready to be recorded after you've you know dealt with it and and had some emotion attached to it? Oh. Well, I don't think th- I don't ever I don't ever like them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're no, not no, ever done, it. you know. Like they're not ever done. Right? Do Do you like Do you like the writing process, the recording process? I like the, the recording. I like the recording process yeah. a, a lot now. Also, because I do it, I'm a producer and I and I'm, and I engineer, and so. 
being able to make my way around the gear. I always have. I mean, I've produced my own records for a long time, but like, um, and produced other people here and there too. Uh, and more and more as women are being asked to produce things, which is finally starting to happen. Right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I love writing. I love when, a, I mean, there's nothing better than when a song comes at you, you know, like the gift of a song is given to you. And then that that's just so beautiful. And knowing that, like knowing, knowing my way around how to shape song now, because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and knowing when I'm over shaping it, like, like right now I'm in the middle of make, I have a mix that I'm working on of a song that I wrote and like, I'm chasing this mix. Like I'm trying to fix the song in the mix and it's not working and it's so frustrating. And yet I know that that's what I'm doing, but I can't stop doing it. It's like, <laughs> it's like insanity, you right. know? So, but I think. One of the things that we were just talking about that I just wanted to kind of elaborate a little bit more on is what I find now is when I when I first when I was in my 20s and I and I got sober I thought that I had to, I thought there was something wrong with me and so I had to change who I I thought I had to change who I was and um I know and now, you know, since what is it? I mean 13 years now and in, in recovery like an old an older person and you know all sorts of experiences in there all that stuff counts, you know? Yeah. You never lose your time, you know? <laughs> That's the thing. Somebody said that to me it made me feel so much better after I relapsed. They were like, you know, you never you didn't lose the 11 years. You'd be dead if you hadn't been sober those 11 years. And I was like, Fuck. Thank you so much for making me feel better. Yeah, about Because it really felt horrible, you know? Yeah, we don't, so hard to come back. Don't shoot our wounded. No, you know, exactly. It's, uh, you made it's not it like back. I didn't learn anything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so anyway, so it like that idea that I had to change who I was. And now, like what I'm saying, like I get to have days to be depressed. I get to like curl up on the couch and watch TV all day long and eat ice cream too too much so I feel sick to my stomach. And like, you know, I get to do that. I can do that for three days in a row if I want. You know, as long as I as long as my friend knows that that's what I'm doing. Right? There, so yeah, like that's the key. You know, I text and just like I'm on the couch. I can't take it. I've had it. I get it. I feel that way too. Something must be going on with the moon. Blah 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 blah. You know, like there's check-ins happening and whereas before I I was embarrassed that I was that way. And so I would isolate even more. I wouldn't tell anybody like what you were talking about. And that's, I think, the real scary part. Being really honest about where I'm at and uh, letting people know. Like people appreciate it when if I say, even with people I don't know that well, like after a show or something, if I just say, I'm just, I'm, I really didn't eat well today and I'm feeling really kind of jumpy. So I, I got to go take care of myself. My fans are like, cool. Like yeah. they actually get it. Like, <laughs> that is, and, and what a blessing! Rather than just being like, "Well, she was kind of a dick." Yeah, you know. I mean, that's where I love that that we're at this place now, where where these kind of things are okay for it to, for you to be able to say like, "Yeah, I'm not feeling fucking good." Like, yeah, and then people are like, "Good." Like, I, well, not good that you don't feel, but good that <laughs> yeah. you're talking about it, you know? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, getting sober when you first got sober, it was like a walk of shame. Like, if somebody of any notoriety was, it, it wasn't a shame if they were getting fucked up, but it was a shame if they couldn't handle their shit, yeah. you know? Tabloid paper, somebody going to the Betty Ford Clinic yeah. and sunglasses. Like, yeah, yeah. You know that. And now it's like somebody comes out like, I'm going to rehab, which is like, you know, there, there's a, I think there's a good balance in between the, the yeah. middle of it. But I like that it's more celebrated now. It's um, commendable to talk about like where you're, you know, if somebody's struggling and, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that, you know, especially to, to anybody who – has any sort of fan base or following or even a big group of friends or even one friend, you know, mm -hmm. who, who can talk about it and, you know, open up, open up a line of conversation to, to get people talking about things. And yeah. To, you know, like, I don't know anybody who's like, okay, all the time, <laughs> like, you know, unless they're a comedian who is like putting on some mask and then you find out later that it, like, it, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't like that. It was just, uh, 
you know, I, I had I had some good friends who were who were like that. Like you would never know anything was wrong with them, and then all mm. of a sudden they're not here anymore. Yeah, those are the ones you got to worry about. It really you know? is. It I mean, is. I think we have to worry about everybody, honestly. You know, being a human being is not not an easy thing. So, no, you know, but yeah, I I, I think what you I think it's really cool. I think there's a lot of room for increased understanding and patience and. Uh, you know, um, joining of 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 people to help artists and you know traveling musicians. Yeah, I don't. I think I still I really worry about comics. I gotta yeah. tell you, I really worry about them. I don't think they have anywhere near as a community as we do. And um, I would like to, I would like to <laughs> personally reach my hand out to comics that want to call or talk or you know, I'm around. You know, yeah, that is, I, you know, I, I never really include thought them in that. our group, you know, but, yeah, but <laughs> you know, I had some some friends who who did that and like the road dogs. You oh, know, they're and, they're road dogs, those guys, yeah, yeah, and very isolated. Oh, it's rough. It yeah. is rough for a comic. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I'm telling you, I, I was out there, and the only person I would talk to for 12 hours was the toll booth collector, like in my two door Honda hitchback hatchback. But that, that's that you was know, your contact when I humanity. open my mouth and be like, thank you, and it's like. <laughs> Somebody made a no you know what I mean? It's like so weird. I once drove from Oklahoma City to Brooklyn to pick up a girl, you know, mm -hmm. my girlfriend. You know, like sorry, I mean like pick up no. I once I'll say that again so you can <laughs> I once drove from Oklahoma City to Brooklyn to pick up my girlfriend at an airport, you know, and that's a long drive. Yeah. By myself. Straight through. All the way. Straight through. Nutcase, you know. So yeah. But well, you, you were saying, though, that the 14 hours of solitude on the road. Was yeah, but that's longer than 14 hours, okay. I think. At, I don't at, know. At 15 hours, it starts to get a little I don't know. It little gets nutsy. Goofy. Yeah, you get, you get nutty. <laughs> I recently drove from Nashville to Boston straight as well, which is why we're all grateful that Melissa's back on planes. But uh, Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that you're back on planes. Yeah, and that, me too. <laughs> and that you're you're taking a little bit of the yeah. load off. And um, so, so what makes you what makes you happy these days? What makes you? Uh... Oh, that's a great question. I really like to learn. You know, I, I went back to school when I was older, when I was 47, because um, I didn't, you know, I didn't finish school, and when I when I was a kid and started making music. Uh, professionally, I guess when I was 17, when I went to college, I started playing in clubs and then at 20, I was gone and mm -hmm. making records. And I think, um, it was really, it was really fun to go back to school. I started teaching in 2010 or 2011, right before I came, right before I came back into recovery. I wasn't drinking at the time, but, um, so I taught at Berkeley for, from 20. 11 let's call it to 2019 and then I started teaching at Northeastern University in 2019 um, and I'm there now and it's 2024 so what, what makes me happy is um, in in an academic environment I'm around young like young people who are turning me on to all the young to the to the cool new bands right there's just no way you know that i would know who dirt buyer is mm -hmm. if if i wasn't teaching in a music department you know or waxahachie like i i wouldn't i wouldn't know who these bands were um remy wolf although my niece turned me on to remy wolf so i feel like that was her <laughs> um Phoebe Bridgers, who like I was I was into Phoebe Bridgers before, you know, at the very beginning when everybody else was into her. And so like that stuff really makes a difference to me because I don't have the bandwidth to find new bands. Um, but so that makes me happy. It also makes me happy really with the um, with the students that f are so excited to learn from me, which is like feels a little odd to say, but they're like, I have a co-op now. So I have two students that intern with me and they're just like so jazzed about stuff. And I, I'm learning also how to remember to explain things from what they call the child's mind. Um, so sometimes I remember when I first started teaching, I was like, you know, so like you always want to have an XLR a quarter inch in your bag because 
and you want a three to two prong in case your amp is buzzing. And they're like, we don't know what an XLR is. We don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I really have to dial it back. Right. And it's like back to basics. It's like bringing it right back to you have to keep it in the day. It's like, what is an XLR cable, you know? And like to be 17, you don't know what that is until yeah. you pick it up because you're hanging out in a club all the time. Or, in, But that's not how it is these days, Yeah, I, you know? It's not 1987. That's no, not happening. So I, I'm in an age gap relationship and, <laughs> and my girlfriend's 25 years younger than uh -huh. me. So a couple of weeks ago, we were having a conversation and something came up about like the 411. And I was like, do, do you know what 411 is? I have no idea. I was like, you, used to, you just have to call. Yeah. And if it was uh, out of state, you, it was 1555, yeah. 1212, and you would call information and get it. And then it's just like, wow. But they don't even know what you're talking about. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, explaining MapQuest and all these other things. Yeah. But it, it, it is, uh, you know, but yeah, it, it's great when you – because I love it. Because I learn new things all the time. Mm -hmm. She turns me on to bands that I would never know. That's about right. And things like that, and she's just you know, and it's healthy. And because I only, I've only been a functioning adult for seven and a half years now, we're we're very much on yeah. the same. You know, there, yeah. there's no. Uh, You're like nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm definitely the uh, the younger one in the relationship. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's turning that's turning me on. That's lighting me up. And the two artists that I'm working with, Joe and Brennan, really light me up. I mean, like, and then, I mean, I heard Joe's music, and I that that made me want to get involved in the music industry again. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, I wasn't working in the business part of it as much. I heard Joe Chase's music. I heard the song "Lucky Penny," which is out on Spotify. You can listen to it, and it's J O H Chase, and then C H A S E. Okay. Um, and I just started, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I couldn't believe how good it was. That's what happened to me. And I feel like the, one of the other times that has, that has happened to me in my life was when I heard Sarah McLaughlin's record, uh, Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. Okay. I heard that record and I was like, what the actual just happened? Because I hadn't been listening to music. When you're working your own records, in my experience, working my own records, I'm not listening to other people's records much. Like I'm just very right, focused right. on the touring and uh, you're working on a new track and you can't really, it's really hard to listen to other music. So recently, just a few months ago, I went to a show at Passim in Cambridge and I, a woman walked onto the stage in a full length orange dress, like all the way up to here, like 1970s, a little hair in the round John Lennon glasses. And she sat down on a chair and she picked up an acoustic guitar and she started to sing and I started to cry. And I thought I would take $30,000 out of my savings, my 401k, my savings account, and to make a record with this girl. Like, that's how good she was. Um, and she was singing not one of her songs. She was singing a cover of a um, Sandy Denny song. Sandy Denny was a famous folk singer in the 70s who died. I, I don't know if she died from addiction or I don't know how she died. But um, anyway, I'm going to produce an EP for this artist. Her name's Erin Hogan, and she just completed a master's program as an opera singer. So she's actually an opera singer. She has an extraordinary Intriguing. voice. Yes. That sounds great. So that's what make, what's making me happy these days is that I'm somehow right now, and this might only, I don't, it's just happening right now, is like I, I am working on my own music, playing live shows, working with other artists as a manager, and teaching, and I'm still going to all my meetings, and I'm I'm stable, and I'm not. It's like it's like I don't really know how this is all happening. So like I, I mean I'm sure it's not going to last. <laughs> I feel like I feel like what's going to drop. But the plates are all spinning at an even speed. It sounds like yeah, there's that, and you know I will say that as a you know, as a woman who just, you know, I hit menopause a couple years ago and my hormone, when your hormones change, and I know for some women, they become very, the hormone, that change can be very um, up, up turning for them. Mm -hmm. Like they can become very depressed and very anxious. And then for other people, it really is a like click in moment. So I think. <laughs> you think you you found the Something's key. happened and I'm like, okay, suddenly. I, I don't even want to say that out loud. So menopause is the secret. For me, it is. Yeah, it's working great. I'm loving it. That's amazing. So far. Great. So, 
Yes, yeah, so I guess just what makes me happy is when I'm able to engage in in the in the four. I think there's four things that uh, that all make sense, right? They all line up, but they're all impossible if I'm not taking care of myself. And that includes being sober, you know, right. from alcohol and drugs. Um, and it means, you know, to me, being in recovery is different than being sober. Um, so being in recovery and being active in those those different areas of my life, it's really helped me live an even more expansive life than um, any expansive drunken night I ever had. Right. You know. That's great. Except for maybe a couple. No. <laughs> There's a couple of good ones. There had to have been a couple of good ones. <laughs> but this has been awesome. The time has, has been flying by. Oh, good, yeah. This is a great conversation. And I I know somebody is is sitting there giddy about coming uh, on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the portion of the show yeah. which we call Rapid Fire Question Time. It's Rapid Fire Question Time. And we have our guest, rapid fire question asker. Yeah. Yeah. That's my me. work bestie, Gabby Cohen. Yeah, Gabby Cohen. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. This has been fun. Uh, so, funny enough, you answered a bunch of my rapid fire questions on your episode. <laughs> oh, <God> damn it. <laughs> Checking them off. Checking them off. I'm like, oh no, those, those are done. Uh, but, you know what? I, I, I'm i going to take a minute at the top of rapid fire question to say that like uh, you were talking about how you've impacted people and you don't even know it. And like I've been listening to you since I was 19. So I'm, I'm 37. 20, oh, wait. <laughs> 20, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was a, a young queer kid. I was my first adult, you know, out of high school queer relationships and everything. And like your music got me through like my whole life. And like um you like your music you were you, when you were happy and you were in love your music was up more and when you were not it was down and it was like such a a relatable experience as a young queer person like oh it's okay to feel like crap after the breakup and it's okay to feel like this sometimes and like you did that for me and i'm sure you did it for a whole bunch of people my age and my generation so like i wasn't going to share anything personal but i have to after what you were saying that like that's what you showed me. You showed me that it was okay to be up and down always, even if you weren't doing it for yourself. So like that is. Thanks for saying that. that. Very rapid yeah. rapid rapid. Oh, thank you. So there, there's the thanks. person that reads between the lines, like we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, favorite collaboration that you've done with other artists or top three. Cause I hate favorites myself. Oh, favorite collaboration. Yeah. Uh, well, I got to play trumpet. I mean, it's not really a collaboration, but I got to play trumpet when I was on tour with Ani. That was really fun. Um, when I've gone on tour with people before, I played trumpet. I also played trumpet with Mo. I don't know if you're, they were like a college band. I really liked them a lot. Collaboration. Uh, I mean, I love co-writing. So I co I've co-written a few times with my friend Lori McKenna. And once with Lori McKenna and Mary Gaucher. That was really fun. How's that? I don't know. That's a Good. hard question. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, least favorite song request from fans. Like what one that you're like, man, I don't want to sing that one again. Uh, well, it used to be drive that I couldn't stand it when they would yell drive. <laughs> but then um, I re remembered that like you're not supposed to like not play your most famous song. So I was like, am I going to be that guy? So I stopped being that guy. <laughs> that's such a, that's, um, no, there's that's no song. Such a song, though. <laughs> there's no, there's no song I can think of that I get sick of being asked to play. Except for like, you were probably there for there was a period of time where it was like, play drive, and it's like, it's, it's, it's annoying. Yeah, that, yeah. that's you yeah. did record like a ten minute long version live of it. That really should have sufficed a lot I of did? people for a long time. Yeah, one of your lives has a has like an extended long version of it on it. Uh, maybe it's seven minutes. I think I was a little maybe uh, on um seventy people at seven thousand feet. I might yes, have done that. I think so with Brian on drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people should be satisfied with that. <laughs> well, there it long. is. That's the one. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, how do you prevent creative burnout with all of the burnout that you do? Like what's like one of your go-to, uh, 
<laughs> How do I? Cr- <sighs> yeah. Um. This is. These are not rapid fire questions. These are I know. questions. <laughs> uh, what What's happening in my head? I'll just because that's best. If I is that um, I don't. You mean when you say creative burnout? You mean like? Can you just explain that? Because that's sure. Like I how think do you maybe not you're saying it backwards. But. Run out of things. I would. I would. Uh, how do you not run out of things to say? Like how do you keep your uh, creativity in check? Yeah. Um, or like what's something you do like? How do I keep it flowing? Kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I create drama. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. Joking, not joking. Um, Go and stir some shit. Yeah. I, uh, so without doing that, which I don't do ac- actively anymore, I, I, you know, like falling, falling in love or like having, like wanting to have an affair or something like that. So um, I think. What I what I do do is I write, right? Like just regular writing, not like writing a song, not waiting for inspiration all the time to kind of keep that muscle flowing. Like I was talking about earlier. Also listening to music, listening to other music now, which I didn't used to do, staying inspired around that and staying active in mixing. And um, uh, like uh, I bought a guitar recently actually from Meg Tui. I don't know if you know who she is. She's great musician, great guitar player, music, music director for Waitress, the musical. Um, anyway, I bought a guitar from her. And so I've been like just playing a guitar, like plugging in and just uh, staying active in, in creativity in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, uh, where are you excited to travel to other than Central Florida? Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm really excited to be able to get back to the West Coast to play shows for my fans on the West Coast. They've been dying for me to come there for a long time. I'm also really excited to go to Ireland. I've only been to Ireland once. I got to play in Dublin when I opened for Dwight Yoakam, and I literally like flew in. I played the point. I think I think I went downtown in Dublin. I don't remember it. I was drinking back then, and then I went went home. Uh, so I'd like to do the UK again as well in Ireland, but um. Right now, Ireland, I've just been, I have been feeling this real tug at, at going there, you know? I mean, a lot of my, a lot of my um, history, a lot of my, my family is from Ireland and, and the UK. So I've been feeling just like a, a, a nagging to go home. And, and it really does feel like that, like a calling to get back. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Last one. It'll be easy. What's your favorite late night snack? Oh, God, that is a combination. I need to have two things, which is I first put four peanut M&Ms in my mouth and then an enormous, as much smart food as you can fit in my paw shoved in my mouth at the same time. And then I chew all that up. That's what I like. When I go to the movies, I would sometimes buy a box of Raisinets and dump it inside the popcorn yeah, I want the combo of the sweet and the salty. That's my jam. Like yeah, unhinged your jaw. More and more relatable. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hang out in Orlando and eat yeah. corn and peanut M&Ms. Yeah. Let's do it. Right on. Right on. That sounds good. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you, Gabby. I've loved having you on. This Thanks. was a great conversation. Is there anything you want to, uh, I know you talked about the artists that you're working with now, anything that you want to promote? I don't think so. You know, just, uh, I don't know. I just like want to say to anybody that's, you know, feeling like they know deep inside they, that they probably are struggling, you know, like, it's it's really okay to struggle, you know, and um, you're there's definitely, you know, everybody is struggling, and so it's you know it's really like if you tell somebody you're struggling, you're actually like doing them a favor because they are too, and then they're gonna feel less alone. So I just think, you know, if you can find a way to just say like, shit's just real hard right now. Like even that is right. enough, you know. So every time we say something that is truthful like that, it lets the air out of the balloon a little bit and it makes it a little easier to stick around a little longer. So that's what I would say. 
Thank you for that. And thank sure. you for being so open and <laughs> yeah. such an easy conversation. And all, all Melissa Farrick fans out there, download the seven minute version of Drive and listen <laughs> to it on the way to the show. And if yeah. they want to play it, they're going to play it. <laughs> yeah. And Black Dress is out there now, too, right? My newest, I have, I have a newer single called Black Dress, but I'm not happy with the mix, but I never, Life is a Remix, which is the podcast I keep trying to start. So, okay. Well, Good luck on that. Thanks, I man. hope that we could work together soon. Yeah, and man, this that'd has be been great. amazing. Right. So thank you all for tuning in. And as Joseph and I would usually say together, my co-host is not with us today. There's a thousand ways in and a thousand ways out, and we hope you find your way. <laughs>